Welcome, sir. Yes, madam. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning, sir. Okay, good afternoon, sir. Uh, now we would like to introduce our next resource person, Dr. Nilanjan De, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Techno International New Town, India. Dr. Nilanjan De is the Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Techno International New Town, India. He is a visiting fellow of the University of Reading, UK. He also holds a position of adjunct professor at the Tong Dak Thang University, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Previously, he held the honorary position of visiting scientist at Global Biomedical Technologies Incorporation, California, USA, from 2012 to 15. He was awarded his PhD from Jadapur University in 2015. He is the Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Ambient Computing and Intelligence IGI Global USA. He is the series co-editor of Springer Track in Nature Inspired Computing, Springer Nature, Data Intensive Research, Springer Nature, Advanced in ubiquitous sensing application for healthcare elsewhere. He is an editorial board member of Applied Soft Computing elsewhere. He is having 35 authored, 110 edited books and over 300 publications in the area of medical engineering, machine learning, computer aided diagnosis, data mining, etc. With 21,000 citation and 70 age index. He is the fellow of IETE and senior member of IEEE. In this session, we shall learn about deep learning for medical imaging, challenges and state the art of solution. We now hand over the session to Dr. Nilanjan De. Please, sir. Thanks for your introduction, ma'am. So my screen is visible, right? Yes, sir. Hmm. So a very good morning to all of you. Uh, I think my screen is visible and I am audible. So yes, yes, sir. Both are right. Yeah. Okay. So initially, I will start with uh, traditional machine learning, shallow machine learning. How can you deploy shallow machine learning in medical imaging, then I will gradually move to deep learning and I will talk about different challenges of using deep learning in medical imaging and also we will discuss about uh, state of art solutions. So before starting that, let's start from uh, uh, some numbers. So in, in India, India, per patient, how much a doctor used to spend time? So this was a report which comes in Times of India in 2017, which shows that in India, Per patient, doctor used to spend two minutes time, whereas in United States it's a 21 minutes, and surprising number in Bangladesh 48 second. So 48 second doctor used to decide what type of disease you are having, and they started prescribing. So that's why human biasness comes into the picture, because once such kind of faster diagnosis you required, that means there is always a chance that error will be there. Now, what is the number of medical errors? I'm not talking about medical negligence. That is, that might be a huge number. But medical errors are also, it's not a, a I mean, less number. It's 5.2 million medical errors in India per year. So now you can imagine that 
doctors always need a helping system or a supportive system which actually help them to come up with a faster decision making process and they should be less biased so the error can be reduced so that is the prior objective to come up with medical imaging so initially once we talk about medical imaging we talk about one particular type of software design that is called the computer aided diagnosis so what is computer aided diagnosis doctors have the qualitative knowledge and that qualitative knowledge can be transferred into a quantitative knowledge which is understandable by machine by using maybe medical image analysis maybe radiological image processing maybe deploying artificial intelligence machine learning etc so it's a kind of paradigm shifting from qualitative to quantitative paradigm so cat system is nothing but a second opinion to the radiologist which actually helps to come up the doctors for a faster accurate and consistent result and the reading time should be very less so that is the prior objective so that's why once we talk about cat system it's nothing but computer it's a system software system which is a clinical decision support system you can say and there are three different categories first category is called the computer aided detection which is the cad e category second category is the computer aided diagnosis category which is cad x category and third category is the computer aided diagnosis quantification which is a q category so one the first category cad e category for the detection it tells about it talks about mainly the location of potential cancer growth and cad x category will tell you the likelihood of the cancer maybe it may be benign it may be malignant and even the phages also can be you can uh, we can talk about and quantification this kind of software talks about the uh, size and the shape of a particular tumor or a lesion so it actually helps to quantify so these are the three typical categories of software one is the e category x category and the q category and then this all three category comes under one particular umbrella which is called cad system computer aided diagnosis system so the person who is working in cad e category for the detection may not be working in the area of diagnosis or the person who is working on diagnosis may not be working in the quantification part so in general it's a cad framework but there are sub category and different different researcher works in different different sub category now talking about cad system once we discuss about different different image modalities say for example the different imaging techniques ct image or mr image or uv image or say any radiological other images in general almost 75% all medical images are radiological images but apart from these in say for example your uh, derma images or say ophthalmo images they are also cat can be deployed but typically speaking technically speaking radiologist mainly use cat system which almost acquire 75% of all imaging modalities so that's why cat is not meant for radiologist but in general radiologist use cat system so again once we go for cat system the first thing we need lots of data now once we talk about cat system it's a typically complex pattern recognition problem say for example you have an x ray and there is some suspicious say hairline crack or something so you need to dump lots of data into a cad server the data might be diacom data the data might be qtb format data which is a very low quality pattern weighted data diacom data is always a good quality data so you put all those data into a cad server and you can come up with some algorithm with which you can go for a pattern recognition uh, i mean deploy pattern recognition algorithms and maybe you can come up with a decision making process that there is something suspicious in that x ray or not so initially once we talk about medical imaging the first thing comes into our mind is the pre processing part so what is pre processing as i said the mostly all radiological images are pattern weighted noisy dark images gray scale images so we need to enhance the quality of the image because majority of the cases diacom data availability is very less because it takes lots of i mean monetary issues are associated with diacom data so that's why acquisition process is a very costly process generally we get a called quality compromised data just one example is a qtv data so here we need to go for the reduction of the noise sometimes we need to go for filtering process we need to go for labeling some people used to go for colorization etc for pre processing the second step is the segmentation part 
So we actually split the foreground from the background based on the texture, based on the color, based on the shape, based on maybe the contrast level, brightness, etc. So we try to split the image into some two different disjoint set. One is the foreground, one is the background to find out or identify what is the region of interest. Now, once you have that region of interest, we started finding out the compactness, the size, the, the location, etc. So once you have all these, then after that, we go for deploying traditional machine learning. And once we deploy traditional machine learning, it's basically we are going for the feature extraction mechanism, maybe sometime for reduction mechanism, putting into some classifier. Then that classifier will give some accuracy. You are, if you are happy with that accuracy, it's fine. Otherwise, you put more data and you continue this process. So basically, once we talk about CAD, there are four different components. There is an image acquisition and diagnosis in between the CAD works. There is a visualization component. There is a part which is called the decision support system. There is a part which is called the segmentation and quantification. And there is a part which is called the recognition and the model design. So initially, you have lots of data into your CAD server. You read, read that data, you go for pre-processing. Once the quality improved, you extract the region of interest by some segmentation strategy. Then after deploying the segmentation, you go for feature extraction selection process. Then you put it into some ABCD classifier. Then the model will give you some result and the diagnostic result will be assessed by the doctor, but revalidated by the doctors. So that was actually a traditional framework, which mainly used before 2012. So before the era of deep learning, shallow machine learning works in that way. Now, it's not that after 2012, this entire shallow machine learning, I mean, uh, it's not the, I mean, the paradigm shifted, but it's not a substitution by deep learning that there is no use of shallow machine learning nowadays. Typically, technically speaking, once we talk about image segmentation, we are trying to split or divide the image into some region, some disjoint sets, generally based on the gray level, maybe color, maybe texture, maybe brightness. There are lots of different challenges which might not you will face for other image segmentation algorithms. Say, for example, if you are working with aerial data, maybe say remote sense data, or maybe you are working with underwater image, you will may not be face similar kind of problem. The first challenge is partial volume effect. So once we talk about segmentation, generally an example is a disease which is called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a disease inside your artery, the calcium is amalgamated or deposited. Now once inside your artery, the calcium is deposited, it's not deposited in a single place. It's deposited throughout the span of your artery, inside your artery. There are lots of small, small calcium growth. Now what happened, once the blood flow from coronary to your coronary to your brain, it might happen because of the calcium, there is a sudden blockage of blood flow. And in general, that what happened, that there is a case of cerebral stroke. Now, the solution of these is called the intravascular ultrasound. So once you put a probe, and that is a catheter, the catheter will rotate inside your artery, it will emit the sound wave, the sound wave will refract from the inner wall of the artery. Once there is a calcium deposition, the refractive index. Once there is a non-calcium, the refractive index will be different. So based on that, we try to quantify that how much calcium is amalgamated inside your artery. So once you able to understand that this much calcium is inside my artery, then based on that, there will be a maybe a balloon therapy where you put that probe and there will be a blast and you take out all those calcium, the chunk of the calcium out from the artery, then the blood will circulate. So in this particular technique, intravascular ultrasound imaging, the one major problem is the shadowing effect. What is shadowing effect? If you put the probe, the probe having some shadow. Now within that shadow region, if there is some calcium deposited, then what happened to find out exact the amount of or quantity of calcium inside your artery, you will not be able to find out by any segmentation algorithm. So if you deploy segmentation algorithm within the artery, say intravascular ultrasound imaging, and you are putting the probe, the probe having some shadow within that shadow region, the calcium deposited. So because of the low computation of calcium volume, automatically the entire CAD system not works fine. So it's a, giving an example, like say, for example, there is a bus. And within the shadow region of the bus, there are two bicycle. 
So if you are taking some image from UAV and from that unmanned aerial vehicle you are trying to capture, it might happen that to find out the exact number of vehicles will not be able, you will not be able to do because there is a shadow. So one one part is the shadow removal. So you need some shadow removal technique so that you can remove the shadow and you can actually find out the actual quantification of the calcium so that any segmentation works. So this is one particular challenge of image segmentation. Now another thing is as there are lots of noise, so the presence of artifacts makes a big, I mean, hazards for any kind of image segmentation technique. And mostly all the gray values are very close in nature. So closeness and compact value of gray value also make a very challenging task for medical image segmentation. And the partial volume effect means if the calcium deposited in a single place, it's easy to segment. But if the calcium is deposited in multiple place, if the disease is multifocal disease and there are lots of small, small calcium chunks are there inside your artery, it's very difficult. So to finding out, a, say, once there is a calcium dump, it automatically uh, the segmentation will be much more easier rather than if the calcium is pleated into small, small pieces. So these are the different challenges, say, in homogeneity in nature or the closeness of the gray value, presence of the artifacts or maybe the volume computation problem or the shadowing effect. These are typical challenge for medical imaging. Now talking about the first primitive segmentation technique, which is based on the histogram. So if you look into the histogram and based on the histogram, you are trying to split it into two different or three different, say, threshold value based on the threshold value you are partitioning. So maybe 0 to 55, you substitute by 40, 55 to 200, you substitute by 150 or 200 onwards value substitute by 210. So there will be three different distinct gray value and you are partitioning your image into three different segment, uh, segmented value. So three different, uh, I mean, histogram value. So once you do this process, based on that, you are trying to segment the foreground or the background. The major issue is if you look into these two image, apparently it looks to you that these two images are completely different. But believe me, Professor Pass, they come up with a, an interesting paper where they reported that these two images are exactly same, same with respect to the histogram. So if you study the color histogram of these two images, you will see these two histogram, image histogram are exactly same. The RGB component is same. So based on the histogram, if you are trying to go for any segmentation algorithm, try to deploy, you will see might be you trying to segment a cat and you end with a rat. So this is one challenge. Another challenge is the selection of the threshold value. There are some adaptive technique for selecting the threshold value. What will be the T1, T2? In the previous case, it was 55 and 200. But if the image changes, the modality changes, the patient changes, the orientation changes, acquisition process changes, every time this T1 and T2 will be different. So a particular patient also the T1, T2 can be different. So it's for MR that T1, T2 will be different. For CT image, that T1, T2 will be different. So selection of threshold value is a kind of optimization technique. So you can deploy any kind of optimization algorithm. And there is no hard and fast as such as of adaptive technique, even though there are lots of adaptive mechanism, which is not human biased. It, it can be adaptically, you can uh, adaptive, you can adopt that value, the T1, T2 value. But again, these are very vulnerable means for various cases, the values can be different. So based on this first type of segmentation, histogram segmentation, there are n number of algorithm are there in the market. So if you go through segmentation based on histogram, you will see n number of segmentations are there. But these challenges are there. Second is the age-based technique. Say there are another m number of segmentation algorithms are there, which is based on the age-based. So talking about the age-based segmentation, you are trying to catch the contour. But the problem is majority of the cases, the radiological images, as I said, mostly perturbated and noisy data. So once the data lies in the, the noise lies in the age or in the contour, the age which you are detecting by the segmentation technique may be a false age, which is nothing but the noise. So initially you segment something and you reported that this is my contour, but ultimately you will found that this is not the contour, it's nothing but noise. So this is called false age detection or another technique is once you go for pre-processing the image, majority of the cases, the image is getting blur. Now, say, for example, if you are deploying 
though in medical image there is no way you can use median filter because there is no presence of salt and pepper majority of the cases it's pickle noise but let's say assume there is salt and pepper noise and you are deploying a median filter of size 3 cross 3 now what will happen it will make the image completely blur now once you increase i mean the number of the filter i mean the filter say 3 cross 3 or 4 cross 4 or 5 cross 5 you will see blurriness will increase now for that what happen we always need to preserve the age information because once you are segmenting based on the age if your age is not preserving then ultimately the segmentation will be failure so once you blindly deploy any kind of filtering technique to remove the noise what happened the age is also getting blur so once the age is getting blur that means the age is not preserved once the age is not preserved any age based segmentation not works so that's why age preserving filtering is another research area where people try to design some filter the filter will work fine everywhere except where there is a change of dy dx or that means once there is a grad change there is a change of age so that means if there is a gradient change dy dx change so the filter will stop working so it works fine everywhere except the ages in this way you might retain the age information you might preserve the age information so that the age based segmentation will work now talking about the another i mean the age based segmentation there are few limitations as i said one limitation is the smoothing the age preserving filtering you have to use and you have to identify what is my false age otherwise you will see you compute the ages which is not actually ages so under age based segmentation there are as i said m number of another algorithms are there then comes the region based segmentation so region based segmentation means based on the say your uh, some seed point you are trying to grow based on the gray value you are either merging the similar kind of gray value which is close to each other or maybe you start with a larger region then you split into small small pieces so it's a kind of merging and splitting technique and there are lots of region based another segmentation algorithms are there in in uh, i mean you can study in literature but the problem is the under segmentation and over segmentation so if based on the a uh, seed value you are trying to split it and merge it we don't know where to stop so the optimal selection or the stopping criteria selection is another thing see it's not that after 50 segmentation i will stop so under segmentation and over segmentation is a big issue of such kind of region based segmentation technique if the under segmented the medicine might not work and if you are dealing with brain imaging and you are going for over segmenting that what happened maybe the patient go for paralysis so that's why the optimal selection of i mean such kind of this value of this region how many numbers of region again it's a typical optimization problem <clears throat> there can be you can deploy any kind of heuristic algorithm or any kind of meta heuristic algorithm even though they are stochastic in nature so this is the third category under which almost all segmentation comes from many segmentation so histogram based age based and region based so if you look into any segmentation algorithm if it is not a hybrid segmentation generally in general this or uh, uh, it comes any of these segmentation technique which are having fundamental some limitations or flaws so people try to combine these algorithms to overcome the limitation sometimes the region based and the age based or maybe the age based with the histogram based technique they come up with some hybrid technique and this hybrid technique sometimes works fine sometimes not works fine and the major issue is once you are hybridizing two different algorithms that means the complexity will automatically increase and once you report the complexity it's a kind of if you not follow the trade off might be the patient for whom you are actually deploying the cad system based segmentation algorithm and that took lots of time and it is actually not acceptable for various diseases because the patient will not wait so that's why uh, this is one example of active contour model which is given by professor pass in 87 this is one of the example where uh, it's based on either you can say it's a global region based algorithm where you try to capture the regions based on the seed point so you are either growing or splitting as i said so based on that you are trying to capture the age information so here what you are doing you are putting a parametric curve and the curve is getting fitted in such a way where the energy level is minimum 
So if the image size is small, if it is a lesion or it is a tumor, then what happened? It takes less number of iteration. But if the image size is too large and the quality of the image is too good, maybe diacom image, then the iteration takes lots of time. So for small size images, this kind of contour based technique works fine. Even though it's a very old technique, but still in medical image, lots of people use either ACM or maybe any kind of variants of ACM. One of the good example of one variant is snake model. So active contour model, uh, it, it's an old technique, but again, it's a well known technique where we try to come up with uh, finding the age information based on the region. So this is one example. Now, once you have this segmentation result, then you need some ground truth. Ground truth means the doctor will give you the ground truth and you compare with the ground truth. So the ground truth may be red colored. The blue color is the, uh, say, uh, your the CAD system generated segmented outcome. Then you try to find out what is the, uh, I mean, in between, what is the differences? So if there are two normals, what is the internormal uh, deviations? So if they are very close to each other, that means your CAD system segmented result is very close to the ground truth. If it is too far, that actually tells you its the variability is too high. So based on the variability, you can decide that this segmentation is acceptable or not acceptable. So this is measured by figure of merit or precision of merit with the auto and the ground truth can be compared. How closer your ground truth, I mean, the signal is or the auto generated result is with the ground truth. In this way, you can find out that I will go for this algorithm or will not go for this algorithm. Sometimes these doctors don't have that much of time. This can be done by inter-observer variability or inter-observer variability within the observer or between the various observers. So you can come up some ground truth. So if you have ground truth, you can benchmark your generated outcome and you can find out what is the variability in between these two. So that can be measured by, as I said, figure of merit or precision of merit. There is some another technique which is called semi-automated system in medical system, automated medical, I mean, people always prefer for automated segmentation, but it might happen, say, for example, this is one example, here is the optical cup and the disc det detection, the disease is called, say, glaucoma, which is one of the silent killer, there is no same, no pain, no symptom, nothing. So in this case is, which is not like in the second optical, highest optical disease, one is a cataract is a very first one, prominent one. Second is the glaucoma, where we try to compute the, from the center, we try to find out what is the uh, radius, the ratio of the radius in between this optical cup and disc. If it is above 0.58, it's a clear case of glaucoma. Now, doing the same might be, it might happen because of the brightness or the contrast level. These, I say 99 cases, the segmentation result works, works fine. But one case is, it's not, properly capture the optical disc or the cup. So that's why you need to give the doctors a tunable kind of software by which they will drag those points and based on the human experience and expertise, they will try to freeze it so that all 100 will be good for you, your usage. And this is one kind of semi-automated system where the automated outcome can be fine-tuned by human intervention. So it's basically giving the doctors a second it's a tool kind of thing where they are expertise, they can fine tune the result and the result will be much more better. So this is called the semi-automated segmentation. So once you have all these segmentation, as I said, these are all having different, different limitations. You go for extracting the features. So say, for example, yeah, a prominent, mostly radiological images are gray color images. Uh, but few of them, say, for example, if you are deploying, say, ophthalmo image for diabetes, so it, it may be the diabetic retinopathy can be soft exudate, maybe hard exudate, maybe macro calcification is there, maybe hemorrhage is there, duation is there. So the size and the shape and roughness, the color, the depth will be different. So based on the color, I mean, what is the presence of the color? Maybe it's a white or it's a reddish or it's a yellowish. So based on that or the depth, you can find out, I mean, different, different features. So this is one prominent feature, which is called the color feature. The second category is the texture feature where you you have uh, one, say, for example, this is one uh, hypothalamus image. And in this image, rat's brain image. So you are trying to split it into small, small, say, square. Then you intermingle all these. It looks like something like this. These are the different level of fibrosis. So here, the, the hepatic image is a kind of mice hepatic image. It's a one fibrosis number one, fibrosis level two, level three. So these are different, different texture, which shows you the level of calcification or uh, sorry fibrosis presence of fibrosis 
So similarly, say for example, if you are dealing with a breast cancer and breast cancer, if you look into the breast cancer images, you will see in the mammogram, it might be fat, it might be fat granular, it might be dense granular. These all can be identifiable by the texture or maybe by the color. So this color and texture plays a significant role in shallow machine learning. And the last type of feature is the <coughs> shape based feature. Say for example, <coughs> in our teeth, there is a periodontal ligament and the ligament is getting inflammated and the size of the ligament is something inflammated part is not very regular geometric shape. So you put an elliptical shape curve and they try to find out what is the deformation, how much getting is deformed. So you put an ellipse and try to find out what is the deformation. That deformation you can train your system so that the machine learning algorithm can understand what is the shape of that particular non-geometric shape uh, features. So in this way you can actually find out. So these are the corresponding book for all those features which we have written. You can, uh, I mean, go through this is the one texture features. This can be one for the segmentation. This can be one for the shape based recognition system, etc. So these are the three typical categories of feature and all those features. If you talk about say GLCM feature, if you are talking about say any kind of hydraulic feature or anything, I mean, majority of the cases, if statistical value comes from either safe features or maybe the color feature or the texture feature. So if you're dealing with a Gabor feature or maybe weblet features, there are lots of different features. So once you have all those features, then the next is you have large number of parameters. Data set number is very less because if you are dealing with say X-ray, maybe 100 data or 200 data, 500 data and the number of parameters that attributes the features are say 100. So always there is a chance of duplication maybe the poor predictor. So you need to go for a proper ranking mechanism, which will actually help you to rank those features. So you need a particular strategy, which is called the dimension reduction. You come up with some by deploying LD or PCA, you come up with some less number of prominent features. But the problem of this kind of say less number of data and large number of parameter is one is sometimes it getting overfitted. Sometimes the training takes lots of time because of the large number of parameters and the variance large variance because if the data size is very less the variance will be automatically high so these are the typical issues of uh, if you not go for dimension reduction so if you put all the feature into the classifier you might face such kind of issues so for that there are two typical technique actually three typical technique one is called the filtering method one is called the wrapping so for filtering you need to find out that features and the response both are continuous. Then you will go for Pearson correlation. If continuous categorical, you will go for LDA. Categorical continuous, you go for ANOVA. If it is a categorical categorical, you will go for the chi square. So you have a large number of features. You make a subset and continue the process based on the features. If there are two features, they are very similar. You will take one and you will discard the next. In this way, you will try to filter or maybe the wrapping procedure which is the vice versa of this. You start with a single feature, then you increase more and more feature. Automatically the feature set will be larger. So the based subset you will try to find out. And there is a third technique, which is called the hybrid technique, which is a combination of filtering and wrapping method. So these are statistical sum method, which actually helps you to come up with, uh, I mean, proper number of feature so that you can deploy it. So once you have all those features, you put it to some machine learning algorithms. In the CAD system, the most significant features you put. And generally, if you look from the very beginning, the pre-processing, the segmentation part, the region of interest, interest extraction part, the feature extraction part, selection, the reduction mechanism, all are manual interventions are there. So it depends upon which particular algorithm you are selecting. What are the limitations of those algorithm? So if you not select this particular segmentation, what will be the output of the segmentation B? If you deploy B, people will ask what is the outcome of C. So similarly for the features also, similarly for the selection mechanism also, similarly for the, I mean, prioritization also of the features. So manual intervention is always there. So that's why there is a, there is a tendency of people or the researcher who started to come up with a framework or the CAD system design where the human intervention should be very less. So we have a small size pattern, we'll come up, ensemble those, we'll come up with a larger pattern, we'll again make a more larger pattern in this way. Can we come up with a framework where the dependency of these, 
I mean, manual intervention will be a selection procedure will be very less. So that was the initial motivation of using CNN based CAD system. So I'm talking about back to 2012, that era where first time CAD system from the traditional framework, from the shallow machine learning framework, they actually convert into a deep learning framework, deep CAD, which is actually initiated with CNN strategies. So that was the main motivation. So as we, as we talked about shallow machine learning, so this is an input image, you select for the features, put it into some ABCD classifier, you get some result. But for the deep learning cases, you have the input, you have a neural network, you get the output. In between, there is a black box, which gives you the right result. So CNN based technique, there are lots and lots of data you required, which gives a high accuracy and rapid processing time. So that was our prior objective, because I started from that slide where you actually have gone through that 48 second required for Bangladesh doc doctors. So that's why we need to justify means we need to come up with some system. So that is the main motivation. Now talking about deep learning, the see deep learning is nothing as such new thing. It's a kind of the representation of neural network will be a little bit of different. So which is the best representation of our data. This is one of the good example, which is given by Professor and Goodfellow in 2016. Professor Godfellow actually said that if there are two different geometric shapes, say for example, one circle and one triangle, then if somebody asks you to draw a kernel, maybe a straight line, which will separate these two geometric shapes, apparently it looks to you that it is not possible for neural network maybe. But if you represent the data in a different way, from Cartesian to polar, from XY to R theta, the data will look like this. Then putting a kernel or a straight line will be very easier for you. Then life will be easy from polar. You again convert into Cartesian and this will be a round circle. So this is nothing but one particular the representation of the data in a different way. So the kernel is a, how the kernel is working, how it is representing the data in a better way. That is the only focus of deep learning. So once we talk about learning, it's an automatically search process. Once we talk about shallow machine learning, it's a kind of the representation in deep learning is rather better than the shallow machine learning. So it's a representation of data only, nothing else. So talking about before going to start talk about this uh, deep learning, let's a uh, little bit focus on the data side. See any machine learning algorithm, the intrinsic nature is the hungriness. There is always machine learning algorithms are very much hungry of data. Because machine learning algorithm is very much depends on or very much sensitive to the data which you are using. So the data which you are using, if it is a garbage, the result will be automatically garbage. So that's why we always need to look into the data, observable consistency points of the data point, which are using <clears throat> for the target. So the first thing is data cleaning process. You have to identify what errors are there in the data. The data can be inconsistent data, the data can be missing data, redundant data, contextual error, garbage value, extraneous errors. So these are all so-called bad data. Now the interesting quotation given by one of the, uh, one of our colleague in this area, Anna, who said that all good data are look alike. They are typically same, but bad data are bad in their own way. So all bad data, their badness is different. So that's why there is no as a generic data cleaning mechanism, which cleans all type of badness of the data. So for inconsistent schema, you need one type of data cleaning process. For extraneous text, you need one type of data cleaning process. So that is no generic framework which can clean the data. But data cleaning is important because it's not about big data. It's about good data. As much as good data you can provide, that is more important for machine learning. So two questions comes our mind, how much data we required for machine learning and is there any heuristic mechanism which tells you that this much amount of data is required for machine learning model. See, there is no as such an algorithm in heuristic strategy which tells you that this much number of data you require. As much as data or clean data you receive, that is always better for or the significant for the machine learning model design. So this is one point. Now, deep learning is nothing but a memorization thing. What is a memorization technique? If you have a training data, we try to come up with a model of interpolation. So the basic problem is in deep learning, the absence of relationship in between the underlying variable. 
we able not able to understand that what is the the relationship in between two data so without knowing that we simply try to go for interpolation and we try to memorize the thing so deep learning before deep learning if you talk about the neural network also the biggest challenge is the underlying relationship in between the data is the absence part and that if you try to avoid the most of the cases people what they used to do they cover all aspects of variance so whatever the possible combination permutation is possible all types of data if you can feed then it is very easy for the machine learning model to come up with a rational decision so it's not about good data it's about variable data so as much as variable good data you can provide machine learning model will be good so again it's not about more and more data it's more and more clean and variable data that is the main more, main point so deep learning generally far away from integrating those abstract knowledge so we actually not focus what the objects are what they are for how they are typically used what we generally if you look into a 7 month old infant you will see they always try to come up with an based on the abstract knowledge a rule from an unlabeled data set they can also come up with some decision making process within minutes but deep learning as there is a lacking mechanism of knowing the abstraction the verbal definition the interrelationship in between the data we need sometime million sometime trillions of data as an example so two question comes our mind so how much enough quality training data you required for deep learning and second question is are all these deep learning mechanism robust how much robust so these are the two typical question which we will try to find out the answer of these two question so if you go before going to the deep learning if you look into the data point if there is a, say say for example one point if you try to fit a polynomial curve if the data point increases the polyfitting will be much more smoother generally so always data beta i mean more data gives a better generalization if you look into linear regression if the point increases the point estimation will be improved linear regression result will be better so if you look into knn if the number of point increases the partitioning will be more prominent predicted result will be good if you go for any hierarchical based data i mean algorithm say for example the tree, tree splitting algorithm if the number of data point increases automatically the splitting will be better so these all traditional framework very generic algorithm structure always shows you that data is fuel data is important but the problem is in majority of the cases in medical image we not get significant amount of data because it's a typical small data set problem so if the data size is very less what happened there is a case of overfitting the variability will be very high and it will be revolve around and another thing is outlier among 50 data if there is one outlier among 5000 data if there is one outlier the first one is vulnerable so that's why if the size of the data is very less there is always a chance of revolving high variance second is the overfitting cases and third is the outlier cases which is very dangerous so these are the typical problem of small size data and which is very very common for medical imaging because you are dealing with 100 x ray 200 ct images 300 mr not more than that so how much important this data is professor pp lee from stanford university in 2009 they come up with a huge data set which is called image net where there are 14 million hand annotated data cat rat hat mat etc and how many distinct class category 80000 distinct category and it begins in 2010 where during the shallow machine learning the error rate was 28% If you look into the graph, once in 2012, deep learning first introduced AlexNet, eight layer. It, there is a dip of 10 percent, so 10 percent error rate reduction. And gradually, after ResNet once introduced in 2015, it is lesser than the human error rate. So, amongst 14 million data, 80,000 distinct data category, human can make mistake, but machine will not make mistake. So, from that onwards, in this particular competition which helps every year vision competition so this image net based competition it is almost reaching to a significant 1% so every year new new framework is coming new new net is introduced and this is getting lesser so professor hilton in 2012 he tried to give up an idea that okay let's 
Say for example, we are not considering 80,000 distinct category. We are considering 1,000 category. Now, how complex the data will be, the framework will be. For 1,000 categorization, you need 60 million parameters and 6.5 lakhs of intermediate nodes. Think about the network. So 60 million parameter tuning is required. So for 1,000 categorization, if you are talking about 80,000 categorization of 14 million, so you can understand how many numbers of parameter need to be tuned and what will be the complex model for the inner nodes will be or how many numbers of hidden layer can be. It's a nine layer convolution neural network only. So for that, it's, it's take a large infrastructure. But ultimately, once we talk about image net, there's, there's a, there is a problem that medical image, once we are dealing with, if you are deploying AlexNet in say 14 million data, similarly, you are deploying AlexNet in 500 CT images, 200 X-ray images. So think about this, that same network, AlexNet nine layer, eight, sorry, eight layer, you are deploying for image net where the data size is 14 million and another side you are using in city image where the data is 500. So you need to think about the small size data issue. So in general, the CNN is very, very good and people use in a different way, different, I mean, area in vision computing CNN, I mean, work very nice. But the problem is in real world, the objects are taken from different lightning condition. They are taken from different background. They are, I mean, that once they are capturing, maybe the object are partially occluded. So it, it is very common. So if such kind of hap, I mean, things occurs, there is a partial occlusion. AI can't actually come up with the machine learning models, not fill up those missing components based on the knowledge because it's a data driven. It's not, not knowledge based. So, the replication of the same object recognition capability, I mean, creating the AI, it's not very much proven, it's very difficult. So once we talk about CNN, CNN is very good for translation. But once the image is rotated, once the image is scaled, CNN not works. Another interesting point is depending upon the image net, we used to do transfer learning. But think about it, all the image net data are so-called good data. It's a massive. But all those data are taken in a proper lightning condition, proper background, proper shape, proper position. So fundamentally, once you use an image net data, it fundamentally proven as flaws. The problem is here. Say, for example, it shares in image net data, all are in proper shape, size, position, proper lightning condition. But in real life, it looks like something like rotated. The background is something like this. Viewpoint is this which is not used for these training mechanism. So that's why ImageNet is always good. But again, it's proven that there is a fundamental flaws. So CNN, once you talk about CNN more, say if it's a rotated, if it is scaled, CNN will not work. Even if you look about, think about the CNN in a different way, how creative the CNN is. See, CNN don't have any creative mind. So in general, if there is a missing component, it will be a missing component. You need to go for augmentation. You need to give the system all variable data, all different types of variations. So that's why we need data augmentation. So CNN is fundamentally flaws, which is not my word. Professor Hilton from a AAAI conference, he actually shown that once you go for pooling, pooling is a very common term in CNN you try to go for max pooling or mean pooling without knowing the interrelationship in between the data. If you are dealing with a three cross three matrix, we take out the max and we remove all the remaining eight points. But we don't know those eight points might be significant, might be related with some other data point. So it might give you a meaningful result later. But once we go for deploying CNN, once we deploy, Simply we remove all those. So pooling is nothing but a disaster. Now, once you talk about the, these two images, if you change the position of face, nose, etc., you will see CNN, it's a kind of feature based. So it, they, it will tell that these two images are exactly same, which is not good because this position translation is a, it's a kind of translation. So it's a positional based feature based selection. And they are saying these two images are similar, which is not good. 
so these are fundamental flaws for cnn even though after knowing all these things people deploy cnn but still you should remember one thing that once you go for deploying pooling you need to justify the pooling mechanism because once you go for pooling say max or mean you that that the some some somebody can question that why you have thrown all those points those point meter might be letter can be say it can be a meaningful data point or a pixel value so as i said that the performance of the model the size increases the data size increases complexity of the problem statement increases in a, it's a logarithmic way it's not a linear fashion you need millions and millions of parameters to be tuned you need faster hardware and you need lots and lots of data so yes it is always good to invest time and money to gather more and more data so as i said once we talk about healthcare data human annotation is the biggest problem but human that clinic clinicians or the clinical experts the doctors they have don't have that much of time to benchmark your data and another thing is there is a patient privacy law for each and every country there are some data privacy law data protection law patient privacy law people are reluctant to share their chronic disease data so in general we are happy with 500000 data so one algorithm alexnet you are deploying on 14 million the same alexnet you are deploying on 1000 data data is important but getting is hard so that's why these are one example you can i mean use this kind of small size data set for your future research these are different different organs different different available free data sets and the I mean, dimensions are also given modalities are also given so next we will try to discuss about uh, another very uh, interesting uh, method which is called the data augmentation because if you have a small size data we always try to increase the data volume if the volume not increases the variability is a big issue second thing is that there can be an overfitting case there can be outlier those makes a significant role in medical imaging so that's why you need data augmentation but i will try to focus that data augmentation the primitive technique or the fundamental techniques they are also having some flaws so we need some separate technique so let's talk about data augmentation so in general data augmentation is a basically we used to do image manipulation so image manipulation is a geometric transformation technique where the main image can be translated rotated flipped into different i mean a flip or maybe rotation into different angles so we can go for zooming zoom out or maybe stretch or maybe shading there are some different technique like elastic deformation you can deform you can go for contrast stretching you can go for histogram equalization color balancing sharpening in this way you can create multifold image so from one particular image you create n number of image so these are some old technique image manipulation technique geometric transformation technique but further later onwards there are few other techniques like random cropping so randomly crop a position i mean uh, any certain pixel from an image and in this way you randomly crop and crop you create another n number of images you can go for blending alpha blending so there will be a foreground or there will be a background there will be alpha tuner so this will come into foreground this will go into background you can in this way you can mix the image and you can create another m number of images there is another technique which is called kernel filtering so from one specific image you can change the kernel variance so once you change the variance level of the gray the gaussian filter it can create different different images so if you look into this kernel filter very carefully if you see one particular base image all the images are created so somehow once you create m number of image or n number of images from one image that is the base image or the parent image all these images are created from the parent image so that means you are putting as a data augmentation the redundant information to the machine learning models so redundant information means you are entering bad data you are entering garbage so once there is a garbage in automatically the output will be garbage out so that's why all these image and manipulation technique even though still date so many people use such kind of technique but they are are uh, i mean different different flaws because all those images are generated from a base image so that's why we need some solution which can actually uh, help to overcome the dependency of the parent image so one solution is the gan so it's an image to image translation so if you have a summer image you change it into say winter image say winter image to autumn image in this way which is a using by cycle gan but it's a very robust and computationally intensive process so you need a cheaper solution 
one of the cheaper solution is neural tile transfer you change the texture the ambience the appearance of the image which is basically called the style of the image in this way you can create another multifold images so this is one say true city images and these are the synthetic generated images by gan so talking about gan and this is one example of neural tile transfer so this is study study night so it's the song which is having one particular style and you are deploying that style into that image and in, in this way if you change the style the neural tile transfer will create different different images and you can create n number of images from one particular image so this is one rather cheaper solution which is very much useful for the fashion technology area many people use in this this is one uh, paper which comes in 2016 in icml where first time this uh, style transfer actually introduced but this is one example another kanagawa wave which is uh, deployed on an mr image and this mr image now converted into an another image and in this way the texture looks like this so this is few of the example where how the neural tile transfer can helpful to augment the data to increase the volume or the size of the data sets so talking about gan there are two different module one is a generator one is a discriminator generator always creates a fake image so if you have say z is a noise which is nothing but normal or the uniform distribution noise and you pass through a generator which is g so g of z is x which is a nothing but a fake image x is a fake image now you are passing to that image <clears throat> to a discriminator the discriminator always try to categorize with a probability that the image is a fake image or it's a real image so the tendency of generator is to always making the discriminator fool and the tendency of discriminator is always it try to save itself from getting fooled so you have a real say sample sets you have a generator generated fake image and the discriminator always gives a probability 10 in between that it's a fake image or it's a real image so this is there is a tussle goes on in between the generator and discriminator and after a certain point of time the generator creates so natural images that the discriminator fail to identify that it's a fake image it simply pass and then it is created as a synthetic image so in this way so if you look into the z once it's passed to the generator it creates an x which is a fake image that x is passes to the second module which is called the discriminator and the discriminator always gives a probability in between 10 and in this way there is a two tuner theta 1 and theta 2 are the tuners so these are the parameter you need to tune and this model gives you the discriminator which gives you a probability that it's a real image or a fake image and the tussle continues so here there is two interesting point one is the maximization and minimization the maximization part is the real data should be classified as real data and minimization part is the fake data should not be classified as real data so it always try to minimize that the fake image should minimize to create the realized realistic data and the real data should be classified as real data so it's a max min problem so we try to maximize the d of x the fakeness of the data by the discriminator and z of z of the d passing to the d we try to minimize so fake data need not be considered as a it should not be considered as a real data so in this way as this this discriminator is a classifier we try to classify that there is always a loss function there is an error function so that loss function here we actually consider logarithmic because if the penalty is very high for the loss then the tendency of doing mistake will be less so incorrectly classified if it is incorrectly classified penalty will be very high for logarithmic cases probabilistic cases so that's why we use logarithmic case and in this way uh professor actually this what is given by games theory which is given by uh, i mean uh, once this, this particular technique comes into the market that is a that's max min game uh, equation where there, there there is two thing what you need to understand one is the generator always creates more realistic data and second part is discriminator unable to identify that the data which is passing through this is a fake data so it simply pass so this max min problem uh, there is an optimization a function you can say it's an objective function we try to uh, somehow optimize this one and after several of iteration one point reaches that generator creates more and more more and more realistic data and simply it passes through the discriminator and we consider it as a synthetic image so professor nas the given this game theory equation this max max min game game 
equation i'm not going into the detailing part of how this actually works this two thing one is a max one is a min but you need to understand that is two module one is the generator one is the discriminator and there is a tussle in between these two and ultimately it gives you a synthetic data this is one example second way is the transfer learning so if you have a large size data say for example image net you are trying to solve a particular problem and you are trying to solve a problem where the data set is very less so what you will do you actually i mean do the process in the large size data then you pass that knowledge to solve the problem where the data size is very less as a frozen knowledge so which is called the frozen knowledge is a, a kind of pretend model so this is the transfer of knowledge which is called the transfer learning by transfer learning also we can solve a problem where the data size is very less based on the knowledge which we acquire where the data size is large that prior knowledge we actually use as a frozen knowledge to solve a problem up called b where the data size is very less again computational issues are there heavy computation is required for gan but little bit lesser computation is required for transfer learning but again transfer learning once you use if it is as it is based on the image net as i said image net there is a fundamental flaw so you need to think about it which particular data set you are using it might happen the images are different it might happen images are all similar type so these are say all are histological data or maybe you are solving a problem histological data problem where the data size is of different different type so that's why that time you need to go for fine tuning replacing the final layer with some certain say layers so that it can be fine tuned and the output result will be better so these are few of the technique which is not very much depends on the data like image manipulation technique again partially depends on the data also there is another technique which is called one shot technique or zero shot learning or few shot learning so depending upon the observable data if the data size is very very less sometimes we go for one shot learning or zero shot learning also especially in the cases of face recognition nvidia comes with such in kind such kind of uh, technique they deployed one shot learning or few shot learning but now it is in medical imaging also many people are using uh, this kind of few shot learning or one shot learning so if somebody is wearing spec hat scarf might be the person can be can't be identified so there are some different limitations of such kind of a uh, few shot learnings or one shot learnings are there but still one interesting paper which comes in 2015 where uh, the first time possibly they deployed this this one shot learning into brain imaging and this was it was a very interesting paper where people first time introduce such kind of lesser number of data based kind of model design so now talking about the challenges and the different different solutions one is always it is good to go for patch based training without train the whole image if you split it into small small patches then you go for training the model the model a uh, train will be proper and it will take time but ultimately your result will be good so it's a kind of batch processing here you need to think about one thing if you go for batch processing the convergence will be faster if the there is a overlapping cases so if the patches are overlapped the convergence will be very 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 faster the accuracy will be very high computationally intensive but you need to think that there can be the result which may not be appropriate so the selection of the patch is a very crucial task means what will be the size of the mini patches depending upon that you need to decide that i will go for patch based training and this will be my size of the patches so that there will be no overlapping catch cases so there will be the accuracy which i am getting will be a good accuracy the convergence will not be a very fast track convergence it might take time but ultimately the result will be good so one is patch based training so here is one example instead of putting the whole image you are divided into small small patches then when you pass these patches into the model training might be that training will be very interesting and the result will be good accuracy will, you will get much much better so this is one technique another technique is weekly supervised learning say for example here in general if it is an unstructured data so if you are dealing with that if it is a all large set of annotated data we go for supervised learning which is too costly all the levels are there if you have small annotated data set you go for the transfer learning may be accurate or less accurate which is semi supervised learning and if there is no annotation you will go for unsupervised learning but think about in between these two i have little bit of say annotated data i have very less number of non annotated data so it's a kind of annotated and non annotated both present 
in such type of cases weekly supervised learning works fine so the doctors don't have time you take an expert help of engineers so for engineers if they are going for the ground truth design it might happen it's not exactly correct the error will be there but you can come up with some annotated data more and more annotated data so cheaper annotation from non expert can be a solution there can be heuristic mechanism which actually helps you to identify the pattern and they can also go for leveling the data so always the bias recurring bias comes into the picture but still weekly supervised learning sometimes works fine so if you have all level data you go for something if you have very less level data or no level data you go for some different algorithm supervised and supervised transfer learning but if you have in between some level data some non annotated data then you should go for weekly supervised learning so that works fine there is a sparse notation within a single image it's not that all the pixels are very much effective or very much actually useful or not within the region of interest so that time we make it as zero and one few of the pixels which are actually i mean incorporating in the decision process will make one rest will be zero so just like power matrix the number of zero element will be much more higher than the non zero element so in this way you can also go for annotating images one zero images switching switch off kind of thing there is an effective negative data set you required it's not that all data should be biased all positive data or all negative data if the data are not well balanced the positive and negative both data are there the discrimination power of the classifier will be less so to to uh, i mean actually uh, i mean to tell that classifier that this need to be discriminate that the positive need to be discriminated from the negative so you need some effective negative data also so it's not that the data set will be always positive data you need negative data to enhance the discrimination power of the classifier so this is another important thing another one is a class imbalance problem as i said your majority of the pixels are not actually participating into the decision making process so you need to identify the foreground and the background so that it will never trap into some local minima so you need to sample your data you need to go for splitting technique which is called the patch based training mechanism just to remove the class imbalance issue so this is one of the another challenge for model design and then comes the overfitting cases you might see many of the cases if the data size is very less it might happen that the training accuracy increases but the validation matrix if you look into the validation matrix you will see after a certain number of i i mean iteration the validation matrix is stop improving so you need to, the training my matrix continues to improve so might be 100% it's giving output but if you, you have to look into the validation matrix also because how it actually works so in this way overfitting need to be studied otherwise majority of the cases it gives a good result because of the less number of data so for overfitting cases what you need to do you need to reduce the memorization capability of the model because if the memorization cap capability you need to be dememorize you need to dememorize your whole uh, i mean model otherwise the memorization cap capability uh, i mean what gives you the output as a an output which is a false output kind of thing so that's why for dememorization you need some certain techniques which handles this kind of overfitting cases which is called regularization technique maybe l1 regularization or l2 regularization which is a absolute value of the parameters or the square value of the parameters so these two regularization technique or maybe drop out layers these two technique actually helps to dememorize the models so so that the memorization capability will be less and you will see the overfitting case will be less so this is the solutions for overfitting cases then comes a learning rate so learning rate is kind of weight updations during the process in neural network learning rate so that need to be tuned in between 0 to 1 this is one of the con configurable hyper -par 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 parameter you can say as i discussed that there was 60000 parameters so if somebody ask amongst those 60 parameters 60000 parameters which one is the strongest a parameters which you need to, which can change the whole model that is the step size of the learning rate so learning rate need to be decided for i mean properly in a optimized fashion you need to decide for any model so for that there are different different optimizer also there like adam ada delta those are some optimizer which actually helps you to come up with a optimized learning rate uh, kind of thing which not gives the model too delayed or too early kind of convergence 
So that's why you need to decide your convert. I mean, what will be your learning rate on the step size? Uh, it's a kind of error estimation amount of the error in which the weight of the node of the network are responsible. So you should not give the full amount. You should give a scaled amount. That is basically the learning rate. So that need to be decided. Then comes to another problem. One is called the vanishing gradient problem. One is called the exploding. So if there is an input, there is an output, and it might happen after a certain iteration, maybe it approaches to zero. That means the gradient is almost vanished. So if there is a gradient vanished problem issue, uh, it, I mean, it never converges to an optima. So that's why you need to think about the gradient vanishing also. And the vice versa case is exploding. If the gradient is getting larger and larger, there is no chance of again, it's a kind of diverge from one another. That is called the exploding gradient problem. So vanishing gradient and exploding gradient, two issues, which is very common for any model design. For that, there are different solutions. One of the solution is a kind of, which is called a deconvolution, which is a scale down upscale using deconvolution. But in general, the solutions can be using of ReLU kind of activation function. Sometimes batch normalization, gradient crimping, etc. These are the few examples which are solutions for such kind of vanishing or exploding technique. Then comes, uh, I mean, these are the few challenges which I actually I was trying to address. That if you go for any kind of deep learning model design, if you go for patch based training, if you go for class imbalance issues, can be there. Effective negative data set is an important thing. The learning rate is a major issue. There can be vanishing gradient or exploding kind of faces, I mean, things you can face. So these things you should remember that once you go for any machine learning model design. Now, the question I asked in the very beginning that how much robust the slides are, these all deep learning models are. So here, one interesting paper comes in TEC in 2019, where they shown that if you remove one pixel from this airplane image, it will be treated as a dog image, it will be classified. So from this automobile, if you remove one pixel, it will be classified as a dog. So one pixel can make the entire deep learning model, say, fooled. So in few months back, maybe one year, I think, 99 mobile phone in a single tray, people used to put into some highway and the GPS was hacked. And it, it is showing that there is a congestion, which is not actually congestion, they fooled the GPS system. So it's a similar kind of thing. One pixel can make the difference. So deep learning are quite good for large fraction of given domain, but it can be easily fooled. So these are the few competitions of medical imaging, which is the data sets are available every year. These competitions and many, many researchers all over the globe, they used to participate where there are open challenges and the data set they used to, I mean, put into Kegel or somewhere where they use, I mean, such kind of data sets. And these are few of the data sets, which are very large size data, but thousands of data, 15,000, 10,000 data are there for different, different diseases. Those who are working in this area might be for them, they can explore these data. So lastly, I have two slides. I will talk about the explainability. So if you look into the explainability point of view, any machine learning models, if it is a very straightforward model, if we were talking about linear regression in linear model, maybe. So they are, they are very much explainable. So how you are getting that accuracy, it's very prominent. But if you go into hidden Markov model, maybe the Bayesian belief, you will see the explainability is getting lesser, the performance is improving. Even if you go into decision tree or support vector machine, maybe you are using random forest or maybe an ensemble method also, the explainability is getting lower and lower, the performance is improving. So once you are using deep learning, the performance is giving a huge result but the explainability is automatically getting lesser. So we need to think about the explainability issue also. So there was an interesting paper, which the title was, why should I trust you? So if someone is smiling, you need to, the classifier should not tell that it, he is smiling. It should also tell why this person is smiling and why other, other expressions are there. Why did the model takes the decision? Which feature is a prominent feature? When the model will fail? how to correct the model, what will be the trust issue, etc. So in this way, the explainability or the interpretability of the model is very important for any model design. Even though still now, if you think about any CAD system, there are very, very less CAD system used in India. The main issue is the trust issue because whenever we get 99% accuracy, say for example, in the COVID days, 
people always reported such kind of accuracy but the explainability was very less that trustable issue is always there so this always comes into the picture so that's why say this one is a one there are different different explainer like say local interpretable say line or maybe the global shape etc this is one example this is a labrador so labrador if you are if you are using say pre trained inception 3 this particular region actually tells you that this is a labrador so it's not the whole image rather a particular part of the image which is the strongest association which actually tells you this this is gives you the interpretability of the model why it is considering as a labrador so in this way for any most machine learning model design even it's a traditional or it's a deep neural to make the outcome trustable you need to pass through such kind of explainer which actually helps you to interpret or make the result trustable result so thanks for your patience i think i am done with within my time it's 5 minutes is there so if you have this is my mail id so you can drop me mail or in any other few social medias i am inactively active so you can send your query otherwise 5 minutes we can talk if there is any query we can discuss about for your nice uh, informative session actually there is no question from the audience so so thank you again uh, to be with us okay thank you sir thank you very much good day to all thank you sir